Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think we will we will begin. We've got some excellent um, presenters uh, joining us today, so we want to leave as much time um, for them as possible. Um, thank you for joining today's uh, Alberta Citizen Science Community of Practice webinar. That's uh, all about pollinators. Uh, my name is Krista Tremblett. I um, work for um, environment and protected areas, I'm part of the uh, Community of Practice Steering Committee, um, and I'm opening up um, today's, uh, today's session. Um, to start off, um, I'd like to acknowledge that while we're meeting on a virtual platform, um, I want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge that uh, Zoe and I are, are here um, within the traditional territories of the Cree, Dene, and Nakota Sioux, um, First Nations of Treaty 6, and homeland of the Métis, and, and a diversity um, of other Indigenous peoples. Um, I uh, hold deep respect um, for Indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of this land, um, and recognize the enduring relationship that exists between Indigenous peoples um, and, their, and their traditional territories. Um, I also acknowledge that many of you, or most of you, are joining us um, perhaps from the same territory or a different territory. Um, and I'll end this by, by saying that while the land acknowledgement is important, uh, it's only a starting point. And in the context of citizen science, I think it's important to ask ourselves um, as practitioners, um, how do we or can we act in ways that honor and respect Indigenous peoples, uh, including their knowledges, their, their culture, their language, uh, and traditional practices? Um, so I'll leave um, that with you uh, to, to reflect on and think about. Uh, before we, we get into the, uh, the presenters, so there's just a few housekeeping items and some broader context setting to provide. And that's um, um, particularly for those who maybe this is the first time uh, you've joined one of these webinars. So uh, I'm already forgetting to change the slides, and I don't know why it's not moving. Yeah. So the um, SITSI Alberta um, is a space. Uh, it was established a few years ago, uh, both you know a virtual space and and I suppose a physical space uh, when we do get together. Um, a place to share information, uh, share ideas, um, and perhaps, um, you know, find those emergent opportunities for collaboration um, with respect to advancing citizen science in Alberta. Um, and this community of practice, of course, is, is inclusive. It's open to all practitioners, uh, researchers, volunteers. Uh, environmental managers, educators, you know, anyone who has an interest and a passion for citizen science. And um, here um, are some of the ways that you can um, get in touch um, with, with us or to, you know, stay abreast of, um, you know, the latest developments and things that are shared related to citizen science. Um, the activities we have, including these webinars that happen about every you know, four months or so, are planned and coordinated by um, a steering committee. Um, and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the steering committee members who um, are joining us today. So there's Kristen um, Maynard uh, from Alberta Environment Parks, Office of the Chief Scientist, who uh, has done an incredible job behind the scenes um, for in getting ready for today. We have Stephanie Weisenbach uh, with Nature Alberta, uh, Bradley Peter with the Alberta Lake Management Society, who is our current um, chair uh, for the steering committee, Tracy Lee uh, with the Mastaki Institute, and Catherine Pierce um, with the Battle River Watershed Alliance. And of course, I'm here with my colleague Zoe uh, Wang, who uh, is also part of that group. 
Uh, we're always open to expressions of interest in joining the steering committee. Um, so if you're interested, um, you have time and uh, want to contribute ideas. Oh, I'm hearing an echo of myself. Maybe someone has unmuted them. Um, um, just sorry, it just happened. I don't know. Oh, it stopped. There we go. Um, go back here. Yeah, we're always um, interested in in those who yeah may have the time um, to to join us as part of this steering committee. So again, here are some ways that you can connect with us. We have an email, uh, a Slack channel, and uh, a Facebook uh, page. Okay, so we do this uh, every uh, or most webinars. Just uh, it's always interesting to learn about the audience and and who um, who who's joining us uh, for these webinars. I understand we've got about 136 people who registered. And here um, again, you can see there's a balance, you know, of, of those maybe who are working for government, also nonprofit, and and uh, uh, individual uh, volunteers, or maybe representatives of volunteer organizations. And. Uh, it, Interestingly, and may, maybe not surprisingly, given the topic today, uh, you know, uh, almost three quarters of the audience uh, has biodiversity as the primary area of focus. And that is it on, yeah, those uh, just, just a few little, uh, you know, snapshots of, of information uh, about who's registered today. Okay, so. Um, a few housekeeping items um, to ensure that um, everyone can hear the presentation and, and that we don't have feedback uh, like we just experienced. Please remember to mute your line um, during the presentations. Today's webinar uh, is being recorded uh, and will be posted to um, sitsialberta.com. Um, and and you'll, when you go there, you'll find recordings from past webinars as well. Um, we are very excited today to have three presentations all about pollinators um, and each presenter um, to give you a sense of the flow. Um, they're going to have about 15 minutes uh, to share and then we're going to open up the virtual floor um, for your questions and um, uh, Steph uh, Weisenbach will uh, facilitate that part of the agenda. Um, we're going to monitor the chat during the presentation, so feel free if you have a question and you don't want to forget it, uh, you can't, you know, you, you don't want to wait till till the end, just put it in the chat and we'll we'll keep track of those. Um, and and of course, anyone who um, wants to can always um, ask their question um, uh, online and not not use the chat. So feel free to do that as well once we commence or, or conclude, sorry, the presentations. OK, so I'm going to start sharing my screen um, so that Justine can uh, get or and Mindy can get their presentation uh, up. And while they're doing that, um, I will just briefly um, introduce them. Our first presenters are Justine Dahl and Dr. Mindy Summers from the University of Calgary. Um, and they have wonderful biographies, but again, rather than uh, me reading through those and droning on, I'd like to invite uh, Mindy and and, uh, and Justine to introduce themselves and then uh, you can go right into your presentation. I'll put myself on mute now. Wonderful. Uh, well, hello and thank you so much for having us today. We're really excited uh, to share with you about the Calgary Pollinators Community Science Project. Uh, so before we get started, uh, Mindy and I are both white settlers um, on this land here. Um, we just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the territories that we are on. Uh, so we are um, presenting here today from the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, Bigani, and Gainai First Nations, the Sutina First Nations, 
and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Good Stony First Nations. And the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, districts five and, five and six. And the traditional Blackfoot name of the place where we are today is Mokinstis, which we now call the city of Calgary. Uh, I do just want to share the uh, map in the background of my slide with you. It's from nativeland.ca. This is an app and also a website. It's really good um, wherever you're traveling, wherever you are, to just take a moment, use this resource and acknowledge the territories where you're gathered. So our project is, is in response to the broader call for community action in response to the current widespread declines in biodiversity, and particularly declines in biodiversity of pollinators. So animal pollination is required for the success of over 75% of flowering plants globally, including many of the foods that we eat. And pollinators are required for the diversity of flowers that we see in our neighborhoods, as well as other animals like birds that rely on them for food. So we, we know that we really need pollinators um, and this call to action to mitigate losses in biodiversity and conserve these really essential ecosystem functions and services, um, as well as the natural world that we can enjoy living in, is what really motivates uh, both of us as biologists and educators um, and what motivated students to advocate for a community science project um, that we'll be talking about today. Uh, so I'd leave, uh, briefly like to discuss the general trends in pollinator diversity uh, related to cities and urban environments um, where we are. So urban environments often have a negative effect on the biodiversity and abundance of pollinators compared to what we would see normally in a natural area. Uh, however, urban areas do have the potential to be pollinator hotspots and foster biodiversity. Uh, it's just uh, up to the design of the urban environment that depends on how well it can support pollinators. So particularly urban designs that work to mitigate the many challenges that pollinators face in urban environments listed, listed here. Uh, big challenges to pollinators in urban environments are impervious, impervi sorry, impervious surfaces like cement, which prevent ground nesting uh, and disconnected patches of flowers and introduced plants that can make finding food difficult for pollinators, as well as pesticides that can kill or impair pollinators. So additionally, we have a lot of honeybees that can compete with the wild bees for flower resources and potentially spread pathog pathogens and parasites uh, to these wild populations. Uh, so poll pollinators are also impacted by larger scale uh, things like light pollution, temperature variation, um, and urban heat islands, uh, as well as climate change. So uh, land use changes in urban areas make it difficult for pollinators and other wildlife to navigate those spaces and find food and shelter. Uh, so it's like when they do renovations in your local grocery store and you can no longer find everything that you need super easily. Um, it's even harder when those resources are farther apart uh, and pollinators have to expend this extra energy to forage. Uh, so in these urban areas, there are a lot of things that can alter plant communities. Um, changing what's available to pollinators. Um, and in some er areas, there may be no flowering plants at all. So the quality of these green spaces determines how well it can support biodiversity. Uh, for example, Nose Hill, a grassland park, is going to support biodiversity better than a small park downtown where the grass is routinely mowed uh, and herbicides are applied, things like that. So any area that has just some mix of flowering plants is better than none at all, as all flowering plants can support pollinators. Um, however, there are some plants, particularly native of plants that might do a better job at supporting our pollinators since they're adapted to our climate and have these evolutionary important relationships with our native pollinators. Um, and that leads us to the question of how can we understand pollinators um, and support diversity in Calgary? So to answer this question, since starting my position um, as a faculty member at the University of Calgary eight years ago, um, I've been collaborating with the City of Calgary and many, many different groups of students to explore how we can understand and support insect and pollinator diversity in the City of Calgary. Um, so the origins of our Calgary Pollinator Project actually began with a series of students' projects um, through both honors theses and a course-based research project um, that over 90 students enrolled in uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So students were really engaged in these projects. Um, as I mentioned, in this course-based project, we had 90 students contributing over 7,000 uh, insect observations. And this project allowed us to generate the very first inventory of Calgary insects. It spanned many different groups and also included uh, recording records of endangered species that were found here in Calgary. 
So with this, we were able to use the students' work to create the first list of native bees in Calgary. We found over 199 different species, um, representing you know 60% of all the bees found in Alberta, as well as endangered species. Um, and from that, one of the students from the course uh, went forward and created uh, a fantastic identification guide specifically for Calgary. Um, this is a great resource. You can click on the link there if you're interested more in identification guides. Um, and we were really excited to just see the diversity of bees in Calgary. Um, student projects kind of expanded outwards. We'd have had multiple students help generate digital collections, um, including both a native bee digital collection as well as a native plant collection. Um, and our work went kind of beyond to also help answer some of the questions posed by the city of Calgary. So one of the questions the city asked us was about exploring the city efforts at roadside naturalization. So students went out over the summer and surveyed roadside habitats that were naturalized um, as well as or left to naturalize as well as mowed roadsides. Um, and you can see the results of how many different pollinators they were able to observe on flowers at those two sites compared to park locations, and then a specialized naturalized area called the Bee Boulevard. So the Bee Boulevard actually started as a roadside naturalization project um, and then became a, a city park now. Um, and so as a result of students' work, we were able to really provide the city with some information about um, how roadsides really do provide um, support for pollinators. The city was also very interested in better understanding how what uh, native plants best support pollinators. Um, so they asked us, they gave us a list of those that they commonly used in restoration projects. Uh, students went out and sampled all of the different pollinators they could find on them. And we were able to identify those uh, plants that supported the most pollinators. So this was used by the city to help them with their restoration efforts. Um, but we also were able to put these recommendations um, into a guide for all uh, community members in Calgary uh, who are interested in planting in their backyard schools or other community areas. Um, so students were really excited, you know, by the diversity of insects we found. Um, many they'd never even knew that we kind of shared Calgary with. Um, and they were also really excited about how their research could be applied and used by the city. Um, and one of the neat things about doing a lot of this work during quarantine is that many students took out their siblings, parents, and children with them when they were doing these projects. So we got to hear a lot of really interesting intergenerational stories about insects and their experiences. But after the end of the course, um, quite a few students were really advocating that we should expand this beyond just something students could do while they're in university, but to be something that they could do with their family and friends outside as well. So in 2021, um, we partnered with the Office of Sustainability, Corey Steen is shown here on the left, um, as well as three students who did a project over the summer to launch the community science project, Calgary Pollinator Count. So this took place in summer 2021, um, and you can all get involved in it. Um, and Justine will talk more about the project. Yeah, so since um, Mindy started the Calgary Pollinator Project in 2021, um, I took it over uh, just about uh, a little over a year ago now. Um, and basically, it's just a iNaturalist project for the pollinators uh, in the city. Uh, the way it works is you go out, you take a picture of a pollinator uh, visiting any flowering plant that's landing on a flower, and um, then you just upload that to the net iNaturalist platform. And you can use the app on your phone or the website. Um, and once you upload it, there's a huge community of people online, I'm sure as you know, that will help you uh, identify the pollinator or the plant. Um, and then you can put these um, into different projects um, whether that be a different project or it be our project, the Calgary Pollinator Count. So our uh, project now has over uh, 10,000 observations of different plant pollinator interactions, um, which is amazing. Uh, we have over 415 insect species, uh, 577 different plant species, uh, and over 865 public participants on iNaturalist. So the project is online, 
Um, and I wanted to bring it more into the community as well. So with my thesis and my work, I wanted to do more of a community science rather than citizen science. Uh, so bringing community community members out, going for walks, taking pictures all together so we can learn together uh, from one another. Um, and it's been really amazing uh, over the last year. I hosted about six different pollinator walks uh, throughout the summer, different parks in the city. Um, we had about a total of 70 different people attend these walks. Uh, about 20 people came to every walk, which is um, amazing uh, that we had so much interest in this project. Um, and it was just overall a great way to bring a bunch of people together and learn about pollinators and nature and biodiversity. Um, and we've got a lot of information from this project so far already. So um, in the project, um, last year in 2023, doing these community events has almost um, like doubled uh, or as almost as many observations as 2021 and 2022 um, combined. So we had much more engagement with the project. Um, again, over 10,000 observations to date. Um, and those community events really um, help to increase excitement and engagement with the project. And we hope to keep that going uh, and shifting this citizen science to more of a community um, and group activity. Um, Within the project, we have kind of a breakdown of the insects that we found. Most commonly, um, people were taking pictures of bees, ants, and wasps, or flies. Uh, we have a lot of butterflies as well, um, and then some uh, beetles and true bugs in the project. Um, and then looking at our most commonly uh, observed pollinator species, uh, we have some a butterfly like clouded sulfur, a fly like a drone fly, um, and then quite a few bumblebee species. We have our cryptic bumblebee, Hunt's bumblebee, Nevada bumblebee, um, things like that. We also have quite a few skippers that were observed in the project um, and another butterfly, the cabbage white. Uh, and then we also looked at the plants in the project. Uh, so we have quite a few uh, native plants here. Uh, we have our blanket flower, purple cone flower, fireweed, goldenrod, furry crocus, um, some wild rose, uh, shrubby sink foil, asters, uh, snowberry, things like that. Um, these are all going to be updated hopefully soon uh, with some new data from uh, last year, uh, but this is currently uh, what we have. Um, and yeah, so hoping that this project will continue to contribute um, to learnings about biodiversity in the city. Um, and I hope that my project will give us more um, information on how we can support pollinators in the city. Uh, we can update these planting guides and recommendations um, and hopefully make some recommendations about areas in the city where biodiversity might need a little bit more support. Uh, through the community science aspect of my project, my goal is to spend uh, spread um, some more information on why biodiversity is so important to all aspects um, of life and help people learn how they can make individual changes that will have a lasting impact. So we'd like to say thank you so much um, for giving us the time to share out our project. Um, the Calgary Pollinator Count, particularly such since Justine has kind of taken on the organization of it, um, has been a great way to bring together our community here on campus and beyond. Um, I would just like to note that this is part of a much wider initiative. Both the City of Calgary and the University of Calgary are B campuses and B cities. So we also run lots of other events and we've been bringing in lots of different groups. So we've had the drama department giving plays the past two summers around pollinators. Uh, various artists and student artists have collaborated. And so if anyone's interested in getting involved um, in any different way, we would love to, to work with all of you. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time this, this afternoon. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Mindy and Justine. Um, what, um, I was just struck by the and excited to see the applicability of what you're doing. You know, the fact that you're able to create uh, information resources for Calgarians around native plants that that they could uh, plant themselves to nurture spaces for pollinators. So awesome work. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll uh, I see some some questions coming in. Want to acknowledge those, but we'll we'll hold that till till the end, and we'll have sort of like a panel. Uh, Q&A facilitated by Stephanie. Um, so I would like to invite Ron and Matthias um, to queue up your presentation. Uh, and Ron and Matthias are with the Alberta Native Bee Council. Um, so welcome and uh, over to you. Yeah, well, thank you, Christine. 
Uh, Matthias Fenton and I, along with several other people, are directors of the Alberta Native Bee Council. And this is a nonprofit with a mandate to understand and protect our several hundred species of native bees that are found in Alberta. So volunteers, including citizen scientists, we find are absolutely essential to the Alberta Native Bee Council's continued success. So many um, citizen scientists will steward or keep bee houses or domiciles uh, in their backyards. And it can be really discouraging if domiciles are installed in a backyard and no native bees visit the domicile or make a nest there. So Matthias will be presenting his analysis of data gathered by the Alberta Native Bee Council. And this is data which might improve the success of bee nesting and help keep our volunteers more engaged. So I want to briefly introduce Matthias because he's going to be doing all the talking from this point on. And he is uh, yet another one of us who started his academic work in physics. And he became enamored with ecology. In his case, he studied sound for his physics masters. This led him to study sounds made by beetles, which brought him to insects for his ecology masters. And now, as you see, he's working uh, with pollinators as well. As you will see, he's a gifted statistician and as a bonus, teaching is Matthias's passion. So here is Matthias. Thank you so much, uh, Ron, for the introduction. And thank you um, to all of you to, for having us speak here today. Um, I. Um, myself, like a passionate participant in citizen science, so I naturalized an eBird since it started, and so it's um, my pleasure to like uh, show you a lesser-known project here, probably um, one of our organization, the Alberta Native Bee Council, that um, was started around 2018, and then um, I joined the club actually later, and was um, tasked to uh, look at the data a little bit now, and these these will also. Um, be the first results we're kind of presenting from it. Um, yeah, so a little bit about our organization. So it was founded in 2017, like I said, um, and it's an entirely volunteer-run organization uh, that has about 90 members at the moment. And our mission is to conserve native pollinator communities um, through uh, different pathways, uh, which are listed here. And citizen science brings together um, our goals of education and outreach about pollinators, as well as collaboration with other people, and then um, helps us to, uh, from the data that we collect, understand a little bit more about uh, native bees. Um, there are a lot of different uh, kinds of bees in uh, Alberta and Calgary as well. Um, so I just show a few here. Um, how did we go about it, like deciding what could we do uh, as a small organization? Well, we chose um, a group of pollinators that is fairly easy to identify and pretty well known to people who are interested in um, these kind of uh, organisms like pollinators, so bumblebees. Um, they are easy to identify to the genus at least, and they also will accept boxes um, as nesting spots. So in this picture here, um, this is a bunch of them that are just getting being um, sort of overhauled for the next season by uh, Ralph Carter, who was a professor at UFC as well. He had a lot of those, um, and I was visiting them that day. Um, naturally, bees will or bumblebees will um, nest in cavities or just in like any area that's protected from the humidity and the rainfall, such as this grass pile that's from my yard from last year. Um, and then when I looked at it closer, this is after the season was over, um, you could find the, the cells of the bumblebees um, in the grass pile. And I, know, I knew they were there the whole time because they were going in and out. Um, but not everyone likes to leave uh, grass piles or leaf piles in their yard. Um, however, we do encourage that people would do that, but there's also an option of putting out one of those boxes. Um, these boxes are like uh, made out of wood and similar to like bird boxes that you may know. Um, they just have a smaller hole so that birds actually won't use them. Um, and then we recommend stuffing them with uh, cotton that is making it easier for the bumblebees to establish a nest 
in there. So there are some pictures showing you what that looks like. This is the first box I ever had. It's the green one. You will notice it in some of the talks, uh, some of the remaining slides. Um, and this is what a box will then look like when bees are using it. So in the spring and summer, bees are um, sometimes choosing to make a nest in one of these boxes. And that is what we would like people to be able to experience, which is why we um, try and provide um, people with instructions uh, and help in setting up boxes in their own space, in their own backyard. So if you look at the box inside, which you should normally not do during the season, that's what it would look like. There's a few uh, bumblebees over the cells. You can see the honey pot glistening through in the middle there a little bit. And um, yeah, just um, really fascinating to look at. Is you can still see this nest after the season is over in the late fall when um, queens will have emerged for overwintering and the colony dies down. You can then check the box and see what's in it. And that's kind of then what it look, looks like. Uh, sometimes there's a few dead bees left, um, uh, but you can see the cells that they built. And this is how you will know that your box was used if you hadn't had the chance to watch it during the season. So with our project, um, we have these following objectives. So we want to engage citizen scientists that they become interested in the native pollinators. And um, we think that providing them with a, with a box and that they can then watch in their own yard is something that uh, is very exciting. Um, it's just nice if you can go out, step out in the morning and just look at what's going on with my box. Um, and this in turn will us then provide with some information when data is reported back to us of where bumblebees do occur. Uh, and uh, what I'm gonna talk about for the remainder of the talk is if we can also use that data that we get uh, to understand a little bit more about what the bumblebees do prefer in terms of nest boxes. So how can you get a box and participate in this project? Um, either you attend an event where the NBC is uh, hosting a workshop or like selling some of these boxes. And in 2018 and 2020, we distributed about 1,250 of these boxes. So we know that this many were distributed, but you can also build your own um, using instructions that we have on our website. Um, and it's pretty simple, it's like building a bird box. So once you do it, you might make more. And there are some people who do this and make more of them. Um, because they want more of them. Um, and then if you have the box, we would ask, and that's uh, how we get data, that you report once per year if your box was used. And that's basically it. But we do collect a few more um, um, variables about the boxes. So I'll show you here what our reporting form looks like. We um, mostly are interested whether the box was used by bumblebees or not but we also want to know where it was and the location is anonymous um, or you can opt in to not share your location publicly. And we also would like to know how high above the ground was the box and what the orientation of the hole was, like which, which way was it facing, south or north, or, and then how much sun it, um, the box gets during an average day that's sunny um, and what color your box was, because then we can maybe, and that's uh, what I'm, we'll try to do in the following slides, uh, analyze what um, do bumblebees actually prefer in terms of boxes. We also um, allow for additional comments in our form to like get sort of a feeling about whether people like it or what, what we could do better. And we don't have a lot of people um, at our organization because we're also volunteer run that can go through this, but I did read them all um, as I started on analyzing this data and there are some examples. So some people are really happy um, with the project and it, it, it makes them happy that's, and they are getting interested in pollinators and they wanna keep doing it. So for example, the first one here, we're very happy and we have planted flowers and veggies everywhere and we wanna put it in more bins and more boxes for the next year. And that makes us really happy as well when we see these kinds of comments. Um, but we also do get um, people who are a bit discouraged because with these boxes, uh, you don't have a guarantee that they're going to be used by uh, bumblebees. Um, and this person is discouraged because they think they didn't place it well, and maybe 
even though they have so many native flowers, uh, they think that they're doing something wrong. So there's a little bit of an incentive to us to like, maybe if we could provide additional recommendations of what maybe you could do better in terms of placement of the box. Um, to provide you an overview of the scope of this project, we don't have that much data. If, like Justine had just talked about 10,000 submissions, um, which is amazing. We only in four years of uh, um, getting reports have about 380 submissions. Uh, some of them are multiple, so people who did it since the beginning. Um, just showing you the average here of how many people report that their box is colonized. Um, it's on average about 20%, and that's kind of consistent with um, results from other researchers that have used boxes. So only one in five boxes will actually end up being colonized in a given year. So if you put out five in your yard, you can maybe expect one of them to have bees in it. And this, um, I think this is why I highlighted in red, is a little bit of a problem for a citizen science project because people want to like keep doing it, but it's much easier than uh, when it, they actually have some success and you cannot guarantee the success in this case. Uh, I myself put my first box out in 2014 and I never got any occupancy until 2017, so it kind of lines up. But um, I know when I did get occupancy, I was motivated to keep going. But when I didn't, I was like, oh yeah, didn't work again, you know? And that's kind of, um, what we are trying to maybe uh, learn about how we can place the boxes better. So just a little bit of data following here on our um, boxes that that we have up until now um, and uh, reports. So um, I'm showing here the effect of the height above the ground of the box uh, on its occupancy and we uh, used a logistic regression to see whether the height above the ground affects the occupancy. And it does seem to be a significant effect in that if you place your box a little above the ground, you have a higher chance of it becoming occupied. So in the picture in the bottom right, you can see one on the ground and uh, fewer boxes on average are being used when they're on the ground than if they're a little bit above. Um, another thing we looked at um, is the effect of the orientation of the entrance hole. So these two um, examples in the picture show uh, one facing the sun right now and the other one in the shade. So depending on where your entrance hole faces, it gets different times in the day where it gets sun. So I grouped this in four groups saying no sun, north and northeast, and then morning sun, evening, midday, and just try to see if there's a difference in how boxes are occupied based on that. And there is no significant difference yet, but we see a tendency, and this is something we didn't really think about before maybe, um, is that evening sun boxes had a little bit unusually high occupancy rate. So maybe this is something we can look at more. Um, and then one more variable that I wanted to show you is something that we did have an opinion about beforehand. So we do think that it's not good to put boxes in the full sun because that will likely overheat the box at some point in the season and then the bees will die because they cannot keep up cooling it, which they will try with uh, with their wings and creating airflow, but there's only so much they can do. And we do see a little bit of confirmation of that, that boxes that were in high sun environments were less occupied. So if you remember, the average is around 20%. And then if you put them in high sun, we only had 10% of the boxes that were occupied. It's not significant yet though either, so we might find more out when we have more data. And so just to summarize, um, for this particular uh, project, if you were to uh, place a bee box to possibly attract um, bumblebees to your yard or give them a chance to nest in and be able to observe them, um, if you want to maximize your chances to get it occupied, maybe you should place it above the ground. So this can also help in not getting it wet from the bottom, which could also be a contributing factor here. Uh, and you should avoid not placing it in full sun, um, as well as you could try and orient it in a way that it faces evening sun. We are not sure if this will help, but uh, at least it's an idea. Yeah, so um, thank you very much for having us here. And thank you also for the other presenters. It's very interesting. And I'm looking forward to like maybe discussing some of the issues with uh, citizen science projects.
projects. So the, keeping up the motivation with uh, people, even if if they don't get their box occupied, for example, in our case, how do you keep them contributing? Um, yeah, thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matthias and Ron. Um, uh, and Courtney, you can, uh, if you're online, I'm, I am assuming you are, I can't see your name. You can um, get your presentation loaded up. But uh, while we're doing that, just an observation, um, and you just highlighted it again, that, um, you know, in the engagement, how you maintain um, engagement um, and keep that motivation when maybe you're not seeing concrete uh, outcomes or results year after year. So I appreciate you sharing your story, Mat Matthias, about your patience and perseverance and that you finally got a box that was occupied. So that's great. <laughs> um, okay, so last but not least, we have Courtney Hughes and Courtney is with Alberta Forestry and Parks. Uh, so welcome, Courtney. And um, I'm not going through bios, but invite you to share or introduce yourself, however you'd like to do that, and then you can launch right into your presentation. Thanks, everyone, for, for welcoming me. Uh, really excited to be here. My presentation is going to go um, more into kind of what I've learned, so the lessons learned component of some different citizen science projects uh, that I've been lucky enough to help lead and be a part of, and then how I've applied that to my learnings with um, getting folks uh, in the places that I live and work engaged in pollinator science and specifically bumblebees, um, only because it was easier for myself to focus on uh, that um, uh, aspect rather than all the pollinators and all the, the challenges of, of recruiting some citizen scientists, as you'll see in my presentation. So a little bit about me, uh, in case it's, it's of interest, I'll move that for folks. Um, I am the Senior Landscape Ecologist for Alberta Forestry and Parks. I work in the Peace Region, so that's from, shockingly, Hinton, essentially, all the way up the East Slopes, uh, kind of kicked over to White Court and to the Northwest Territories border. So a big chunk of our all wonderful, beautiful Alberta landscape, um, and, and largely that boreal landscape, as well as foothills, subalpine and alpine environments. Um, I have been lucky enough in my work to uh, not only travel Alberta and see the incredible sites and work with incredible people, including citizen and community scientists, but also work in other parts of the world. And largely, a lot of that has included working with citizen or community scientist type projects. Um, so that's included some work I've done in uh, different African countries as well as Central American countries. And I'm bringing all those learnings back to what we do here uh, in our home homeland. And hopefully this next slide will go. There we are. So uh, I'm going to start with the citizen science principles of good practice. And this is a nod to Krista and others that are on the call. I think Tracy's here today, too, with Mistakis Institute. Uh, these principles were developed uh, jointly between the government of Alberta, uh, Mistakis Institute, and then um, many different uh, series of inputs uh, from a lot of different colleagues, researchers, practitioners uh, to help identify how do you do citizen or more broadly or, or differently community science? And so really, these are some of the big principles that came out of um, all of the different sessions that were uh, put together and led to help guide how you set up programs, how you can implement programs, evaluate programs and learn from them. So going forward, they're hopefully more successful. And as we saw with the last uh, presentation, which I think is fantastic to assess and analyze the data that comes in from the, the citizen science or community science projects is a really important part of, of in that continuous improvement cycle and, uh, and understanding how you can um, not only benefit the, the species in question that we're trying to, to help conserve and protect, uh, but also to engage the communities and the participants so that they feel like their contributions are meaningful and helpful for our end goals. So I'll start with uh, applying these principles uh, in theory because they were kind of in development at the same time as uh, the work that I was doing in Peace River. And, and again, this is just an example of what I've learned to then translate into pollinator science. Um, 
is the Bats in Our Backyard program. So a collaboratively led opportunity with uh, a, a local college in Peace River, as well as our government um, colleagues and then community scientists and the public library, which is a great resource to engage in any community or citizen science project. Um, and we essentially used an existing platform called the Echo Meter Touch Units. They're these little doodads that plug into your phone, whether Android or smartphone, um, so an existing app-based framework. And with that app-based framework and existing um, data collection protocols and techniques, we engage community scientists in helping to identify uh, different bat species presence uh, and where people are actually going to see these bats, which is the map of the pins. And so what we learned here is that using existing platforms are exceptionally helpful when you're trying to establish a program um, so that you know you reduce costs, you have efficiencies, you have existing data protocols and standards. Uh, you might have to develop, in our case, some training materials, but those can be easily translated, expanded upon, and used elsewhere. The benefit of this project is that our application of the echo meter touch units um, and our protocol of engaging community scientists, pinning locations, walking transects, collecting data has been applied in Waterton uh, down south in Alberta. So it's really exciting that what we've learned and what we kind of wrote about in this newsletter on the application of the project uh, can be translated to bats elsewhere, but also, as you'll see later, to community science related to pollinators. Another example that we've worked on where we had tremendous amount of learnings is the Grizz Tracker project. And that again was with uh, Mistakis Institute helping to guide us through uh, the development, the conceptualization, I should say, the development, actual um, technological features, and then also the implementation and evaluation. So full life cycle of the project of how do we actually design our own app-based platform, which has its pros and cons, um, to collect data on our species in question, which is grizzly bears in this case, in a very bounded, scoped out area. In this case, it was Northwest Alberta for bear management area one. Um, and then what did that look like to engage the people, the participants, the community scientists? And then what does it look like to evaluate whether or not this was effective? How do we improve going forward? And how can we apply this to, to other species? Again, in this case, pollinators. So what we did here is, is we learned a lot. Uh, we worked a lot on um, understanding what what worked for the people who were involved in this. Um, we found out that, you know, if folks don't have a lot of, um, if there's not a champion, if there's not a lot of frequent engagements with the participants who are using your data collection technique, uh, you know, the motivations and the excitement and the participation kind of dwindles, which is a good learning. It doesn't mean it's a failure. Um, and if it does, failures are not always bad because we can learn uh, the most often from our mistakes or, or what doesn't work. Uh, and we did, thankfully, um, have the opportunity to write a number of papers. What included was how we actually use the principles of good practice to evaluate the Grizz Tracker program. So we can apply this, I think, very nicely to pollinator programs and use an evaluative framework to understand what's working or not, whether it's the technical components, as we saw with the last presentation, on where to place bee boxes, um, how to place them for greater success, but then also to, to evaluate the role that the participants actually play. What are their motivations? What do they feel like they're getting out of this project? Because essentially it's the people who are going to do these programs for us. And so uh, relating this to pollinators. And as I said, we focused on bumblebees. Uh, I had a couple different project sites. One was in Peace River. Um, where we actually used the uh, Alberta the Native Bee Council's um, Bee Box program. And another was actually in the community of Grand Cache. So two different sites, essentially, where we've been trying to implement the, the Nest Box program. Uh, we, the most effective piece of that program has been not the, I think, uh, reporting. And uh, our Native Bee Council colleagues can let us know if that's actually happened out of the peace country or not. I, but I don't think that's been the successful piece. I think the success has been the actual engagement, the interest, and at least sparking that awareness and curiosity. So I think we often look at a scientist, we're looking at the, the end results of, you know, the occupancy of the bee nest boxes, which it, of course is an important component. But I think what I've learned is that it's also about, as I said earlier, the people and what are their interests? What are their motivations? What can we do to continue that ongoing engagement and participation so that we do get uh, actual use of these bee nest boxes, 
um, by the people and then actual occupancy um, and success rates for the actual pollinators themselves. We also tried to, and, and just to this photo here, we had tremendous amount of support from our local high school shop classes in the communities to actually construct these bee nest boxes. So, you know, the interest and the excitement there to do something is present. And then I think the carry through with actually installing and reporting um, on the occupancy is, is the more challenging part. And it, as we saw in the previous presentation, might be related to the fact that uh, bees might not be in them. So people kind of lose interest or motivation, or they just feel kind of like, ah, well, I failed, so I'm just going to give up. Um, we also did try the Xerxes Society and Ontario's program called Bumblebee Watch. Now, again, focusing on bumblebees in part was because I think people the general public are less scared of bumblebees. They're, you know, the big, fuzzy, happy pollinators out there that may not be, um, they may not spark as much fear as other pollinators or other bees. Um, and so Bumblebee Watch was an existing platform and we adapted it to submit the sightings uh, for our Grand Cache area and our Peace River area. Again, I think the initial surge and uptick of community participants using the app was really high. And then people, I think, kind of, um, the, the shiny factor has kind of uh, wavered for a lot of the people, um, but we have our core individuals who actually still report and still use the app and, and of course, still call me or send me photos um, of, of their observations. So I think it's really good and it's, it's similar to the iNaturalist platform in terms of the, the submission, but very focused on bumblebees, much like our bat work or the grizzly bear work that I've done. And so overall, big lessons learned is, uh, again, drawing from those uh, principles of good practice is to clearly identify your scope, what you expect for your outcomes, your target audiences, and have that, importantly, have that evaluative framework. So these are some of the questions that you can ask in terms of what are the gaps and what's needed. Uh, perhaps there's a more novel uh, approach to, to designing and establishing some of these projects that might spark the interest of our community scientists more so than, than simple observations, uh, presence, absence, occupancy type stuff. Um, and then also think about what resources and support are out there and what could be leveraged. So in some of our work, I mean, in the natural areas that I work in or the protected areas and parks that I work in, iNaturalist is a really great tool. We have project codes already set up. It's a community scientist or a citizen science platform where we have observational data coming in, which then enables me to further investigate or develop questions around further investigating different um, you know, things that I need to know in a park, uh, which in turn can help with our, our management and conservation of those areas. Logic models, I'm a big fan theory of change as well, um, to help identify that scope, expected outcomes, target audiences, this whole life cycle. I think Krista could probably talk a lot about this piece as well and how we've used it in past work and, and er, current and ongoing work. Um, I think that establishing a budget for upfront costs, so that's the design, the development, the, the getting out there is really important and we often overlook it, but also that long-term sustainability piece, which includes establishing a lead champion for the program. And, you know, and often it's different organizations who are the lead and who can carry that forward. In our case with government, that's often quite challenging because this is one of many priorities on our desk. Um, and sometimes it doesn't become a priority uh, in the future. And so having that local champion, whether it's from a nonprofit organization uh, or even a community group that's quite interested, or in my case in Peace River, the local library has been really beneficial. Uh, identifying end data uses is a really important part. How That's part of the expected outcomes piece. How is the data going to be used? Um, that helps to justify funding mechanisms. It helps to justify how you can move forward with uh, advancing the project or expanding it elsewhere. Um, and it, it's also really helpful in, in my world uh, with the hat I wear with the government of Alberta in our management planning. Where can I help to use, where can I use the information from uh, the Alberta Native Bee Council, for example, on their, their bee nest boxes, where, how and where can I use that in my actual program for landscape management? Training materials, one thing we noticed is that um, the language barriers we had with some of the community uh, participants was, was challenging. And so making sure that you have relevant and easy to use materials that may have to be translated into different languages uh, is a really important piece and one that we definitely did not do and, and was a bit of a barrier to having a broader engagement in our community science programs, whether in Peace River or Grand Cache for, for pollinators or, or otherwise. 
Uh, as I said earlier, those timely updates, outgoing information to demonstrate that the participants who are using your platforms, who are, are participating in your programs are valuable is really a big important piece and ensure that that's done timely. Uh, when it doesn't, and this like relates back to having that community champion for the program. When that doesn't happen, I think motivations start to, to waver and fall off. Uh, and especially if you have things like you're not seeing the critter that you're trying to get out there to see, you're not uh, able to you know, see any occupancy in your nest box. Um, but knowing that those, those zeros from a data set perspective are just as important as the ones when you do observe something is really helpful for community scientists. And then I think another important one is planning for that natural end state. Some projects just have that end state. Uh, and so what does that look like? It doesn't, again, it doesn't mean it's a failure. It just means that's the natural life cycle. How do you transition out? How do you let the community scientists know this? Um, regardless of species of interest or, or habitat of interest, how do you transition that project or uh, let, let folks know that there's a closeout? And that's it for me. Yay, thank you for being um, always insightful. Um, and I just want to share one observation before handing it over to Steph. I loved um, the youth connection that you made. I think it was Peace River uh, or, or Grand Prairie. I couldn't remember the location, but uh, yeah. having, um, yeah, uh, high school students help, you know, build boxes and what an opportunity to sort of engage and, and educate and build um, respect uh, for pollinators. So kudos. Okay, I'm going to go in the background now and hand it over to Steph. Thank you. Um, thanks so much to everyone for typing out your questions as we had them coming up in the chat. Um, please continue to type your questions in the chat and I'll try to get to them. So if all of our presenters want to turn on your cameras so we can see your smiling faces, if that's possible, then I'll kind of do a, a bit of a round back and forth for questions for the remainder of the time here. Um, so I will start with a question for um, Mindy and Justine. Tracy asks, based on Calgary B Boulevard, what are recommendations on naturalization on roadsides and will Calgary naturalize more roads? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so we did find that there was good success in terms of, you know, very managed naturalization efforts versus um, kind of more areas that were kind of left to um, left to flower. Um, there was much higher levels at the Bee Boulevard, which was a planned site um, that was specifically putting in um, native plants that were known to be helpful for pollinators. That definitely had the highest. Um, the city has been naturalizing a few other areas of the city and they've brought in um, specific contractors. So Earthmaster um, has been doing those based on kind of key learnings from the initial ones that the city led. Um, they haven't um, put together any reports, um, but they, to the best of my knowledge, they're preparing um, some more best practices. So Earthmasters was really going in and thinking about, you know, what do you need to do with the soil? How do you get rid of those uh, weeds that are going to be coming back up? And then how do you pick plants accordingly? Um, because roadside habitats, uh, we've just found they're much saltier environments. So the B Boulevard was a bit separated, so we could plant just the best the best native plants for pollinators, but when you're getting right next to a roadside, there's a lot of other uh, conditions. So I would say stay tuned for that. That group's doing a lot of um, great work and we'll be able to probably give more insight to the, the sections right next to roads. Wonderful, thank you so much. The next question is for Matthias, and I think you answered this in the chat already, but I think others would be interested to know. Um, for the boxes in the winter season, do you need to clear it out and start fresh with new cotton for the next season, or do you just leave it alone? Yes, um, I forgot to mention that during my ta uh, talk. Uh, if the box was used, we do definitely recommend to clean it out because there could be potential parasites remaining in there that will then infect the next nest. Um, and also, in general, it's a good idea to just check on it and see if it looks fine. If it got wet, it's it's a sign it wasn't uh, protected from the 
uh, moisture well enough to, so maybe the spot wasn't good or you should add some like um, plastic on top to like make it less um, uh, prone to becoming wet again. Uh, if it wasn't used though and your cotton still looks fine or your box inside looks fine, you do not have to clean it. Like we also don't want it to like be like a sterile environment, right? So yeah, it's they, they do like uh, natural like cavities like mouse nests or old um, holes in, in the trees or whatever. Um, so it doesn't need to be like a clean apartment. <laughs> that's, that's um, yeah, but you, you do want to check if there's mold or something like that, in it, right? Yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much. And the next question is for Courtney. Um, you are a champion for citizen science in the government of Alberta. Are there barriers to the use of citizen science data within decision-making? And if so, what are key barriers? That's a great question. Uh, I am one of uh, many champions, I will add, <laughs> in, in GOA, uh, but thank you. Yeah, the uh, there's, I mean, we write about it in some of our published works as well, that there are still barriers to, you know, the mainstream kind of traditional scientists accepting the validity of citizen science. Some of the challenges being, um, you know, opportunistic observations not being geo-referenced, so no spatial data attached to that, um, no real framework necessarily for these opportunistic observations. But I think uh, if, if you know, and as I do cite um, lessons learned from eBird, iNaturalist, you know, there's lots of other folks out there that have been doing citizen science or community science for many years. And I think mainstream scientists now are starting to see that value, that it might not be the most rigorous data um, when opportunistic, but definitely insightful and definitely helpful that can then be used to structure more detailed, you know, investigations into whatever the question might be. So it's changing. Uh, I've noticed in the past 10 years, it's changed quite a lot, um, but we still have a ways to go, I think. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so the next question is for Mindy. When you were presenting about the Calgary BID guide, I have a couple of questions related to the BID guide. Um, so I was interested to hear that Calgary is the highest, has the highest bee diversity of any North American city. Is Did I hear that right? And that, that just sounds um, interesting to me. And do you know why that is? Is it the effort in documenting those species or is there favorable conditions that allows for that diversity there? And the other part of that question is, is the BID guide um, good for other regions of Alberta as well? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so as of the time of kind of putting together that guide, the student went and compared the number of bee species um, across North American cities as reported on iNaturalist. So that's where the number comes from. So we have the highest number um, of different species um, based on that. And I do think it's a combination of a few different factors. So Calgary is really a unique area where we have quite a few different eco zones or different types of habitats. So so we're at kind of a convergence of, you know, the foothills and um, we have, I, I can't remember, I, I'm sure Misaki can tell the total number, but I think we have like eight or, or 10 different eco zones across, uh, across Calgary. So we have different bees that are in different areas. So we tend to be a bit of a hot spot for biodiversity um, in that way for bees. Um, and on the other hand, I also think that we have a lot of interest in taking pictures of bees in Calgary as well. So we're able to get those records in. Um, as I mentioned, um, just in the past few years, so in 2019, we found kind of the first endangered species in Calgary. Um, and that was because uh, students um, were out looking. Um, and so I think the combination of those two things, more people out looking, you'll find more species diversity, but we also have some really unique habitats here in Calgary that helps promote uh, the diversity as well. Amazing, thank you. Um, so the next question will go to Matthias or Ron, um, whoever wants to answer it. Is there a way to deter wasps from colonizing in the boxes? Okay, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, there, there is uh, a couple of things uh, that a person could do. And um, probably the easiest one is to put up a bit of a, of a, um, a barrier in front of the entrance so that instead of flying directly in, the insect, the bumblebee, has to crawl around that little barrier. And often that can be simply a piece of window screening that's been folded around so that there still are entrances. 
uh, for the bumblebee. Uh, another thing is to make sure that the entire nest is really secure. One of the questions that I saw in the chat was, uh, could we put more than one entrance hole in the box because we're not really sure which direction you know, is best? No, we, we prefer not using more than one entrance because it's harder for the bees to defend. And in fact, they defend against more than, than uh, wasps or hornets. They also defend against each other because there are opportunistic uh, bumblebees who also attack the nest. I hope that helps. Wonderful, thank you so much. That's very interesting. Um, so the next question comes back around to Courtney. Um, you mentioned the importance of frequent engagement with project participants. What are some of the ways you ensured continued engagement? And so what worked for you? Also a great question, uh, a variety of strategies. So that would be online platform, um, having a, a blog spot for those that want to check into a, a regularly updated blog, which of course then uh, stems back to sustainability and budget. Do you have it? What's the platform? Who's running it? Who's writing the blog? Um, and then uh, outreach and, and presentations. So making myself available for kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations or coffee chats, as well as more formal presentations that were hosted by the library, the local college, ourselves at different venues, uh, and then outreach at events. So having booths set up and, and showcasing what you're doing or going into schools um, at the request of, of the teachers or administration. And that's all very time consuming. So I think it's you know, the biggest lesson learned there is is not only the budget and the sustainability and having the champion, but you can't do it alone. And often uh, in my experiences, when we do these types of projects, um, they do become side of desk. So they're in addition to other main work or core work. And you start to weigh what you can do in a day or in a week or a month. And sometimes some of those presentations waver, the blog updates thin out, um, because you get burned out because you're doing kind of all of it. So you really do need a team if you're going to have a successful citizen science program. One person doing it all uh, with multiple other tasks in your your day to day or is not feasible or sustainable. So it's a good lesson learned again to say, hey, if we're serious about this, this is what it needs to look like. Here's the budget that's attached to doing this well. And you need to have skilled people to do some of the, the aspects of the engagement and the outreach because you need to have that energy and uh, experience. Wonderful, thank you. Um, the next question is for Mindy or Justine. Could you provide examples of things individuals could do that would have a lasting impact? Yeah, so one of the things you can do, um, I know often people think if you wanna plant native plants, you kind of have to like rip up your whole yard and replace it and it has to be this big project. Um, that's not actually the case. You can start small um, and just plant a few native species here and there um, and then see like how that goes for you. Um, but just adding any flowering plants to your yard in general is super helpful uh, for the pollinators as well as um, in like the spring waiting to do um, your first like cutting of your lawn if you're going to cut your lawn. Um, so just waiting because there's the bees overwintering in the ground potentially. We don't want to disturb them. Um, same thing in fall. If you can leave some like piles of leaves or longer grasses to like create that habitat for bees to overwinter in, uh, it's super helpful as well. Um, limiting your use of herbicides and pesticides, things that are harmful to pollinators. Um, and then just like advocating for pollinator um, and wildlife friendly spaces um, in your town, in your neighborhood, um, and really just trying to make, make our cities and towns friendly spaces for not only us, but animals that want to want to occupy those spaces as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so the next question is for Ron or Matthias. Um, what is the history of the bee box design and how did this design get chosen? Is it still under development? I'm not sure which of us is more um, capable of answering this, but Matthias, maybe you want to turn your microphone on at the same time and, um, and, and we can kind of come to a consensus. So the type of box that was illustrated has been around since the 1950s. And in the best of my knowledge, it was developed by uh, uh, researchers working in Southern Alberta and became something of a standard across a, a good portion of the world. 
The size, of course, would be based on what seems to be best functioning for the insect. Like, can they keep it warm? They do need heat. Um, can they um, uh, defend it properly? And is it big enough to develop a full-scale nest? We have seen nests with as many as 300 cocoons inside, and they do fit inside the size of box that you were seeing. Uh, Matthias, do you have anything that you'd like to say about the design? Or I feel like it's um, a design that's uh, really efficient, uh, that's used at the moment mostly, is that you can build a lot of them. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of room for experimentation, personally. Uh, it's easy to protect this space if it's like square like that, because uh, you can just make a lid that hangs over. But we have someone actually who's um, trying out to make like a bumblebee domicile, they're calling it, uh, out of clay now, and it's like completely different shaped. Um, so I don't, I don't think that it has to be this kind of shape. It's just a very easy to build. Yeah. That's fair. Squares are easier to build out of, <laughs> out of wood yeah. for sure. Okay, I have um, a question. Let me go down here. Um, that I guess I will ask for all of you, but Courtney first because it's your turn. Um, what do you find makes a good citizen scientist and who do you find gravitates to your projects most most frequently and kind of what are you looking for in a citizen scientist i guess uh that's an interesting question um anyone honestly anyone who's interested if there's that spark of curiosity um people i think all people have the capacity to learn uh how to implement a citizen science project or be a participant in a citizen science project um i think that if you have that spark of curiosity you're in come on over let's do it <laughs> amazing and maybe before we move on to the next one another question for everybody is how do i get involved in your project um, and is there opportunity to volunteer? So if you want to just touch on that, Courtney, and if there's any links you want to add to the chat. And then after we do this round table answer, then I'll, I'll close it out after that. So if there's any other final remarks you wanted to make. Sure. To yeah. In, in terms of getting involved, I mean, I think from from that Northwestern perspective, I'm I am always open to collaborating with anyone. Um, I'm currently working with Ducks Unlimited on some other bat citizen science projects. We're working on some volunteer steward groups um, with with trail monitoring. So not related to pollinators, but related to people becoming involved in monitoring and evaluation of of what's out there, um, regardless of the the topic. Uh, with regards to pollinators specifically, we're still working on the projects. And again, we're using because it's logical and, and reasonable um, and more sustainable. We're using the existing platforms um, that Ron and Matthias have shared um, in terms of the the nest box program. Um, we're doing you know walking bee transects um, that that are already established. So yeah, just uh, reach out and get involved. Amazing, thank you. We'll hand it over to Justine. You're on mute. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, getting involved, we have quite a few um, opportunities within the Calgary Pollinator Project. Um, as I mentioned last year, we hosted some community walks. Um, I'm hoping to do a few of them um, again this summer, partnering with some other um, organizations. Um, I know there was a question um, in the chat earlier, like if there were any projects um, in Edmonton. Um, currently, not any that I, I know of. I do have some resources on like how to create your own pollinator project. Um, I have actually created a project for the Peace Region. Um, I'm up north um, from Peace River as well. So I've been trying to organize a project there. Um, and that kind of extends like Peace River, Grand Prairie, Manning, and then into BC for like Fort St. John uh, as well. Um, I think Mindy just shared some uh, links in the chat for um, community science projects uh, associated with the uh, Calgary Pollinators Project. Um, I know uh, one of my colleagues, they are studying rare plants in Alberta, and they're doing some more community science outreach uh, this summer as well, more towards Lethbridge, working with the Guyana Nation. So if you're interested in uh, doing rare plant walks as well and helping out with that type of community science, I would definitely encourage you to check out those links. Amazing. Thank you so much. And then we'll hand it off to Ron and Matthias for for your um, involvement and final remarks. Yeah, yeah sure. So, oh, sorry. Go, go, go. Um, yeah, I also posted our links in the chat. If 
if you just want to go through the main website, we have lots of stuff, uh, information on native pollinators, um, species list, trying to keep it up to date, um, and the link to the project. And there's instructions even on how to make your own box and place it. But uh, we also, what's good um, is to sign up for a newsletter with our organization, because then you will hear um, where we will be present. So at events where you could meet us and then talk about it, if that's more what you would like to do. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, join the council. Uh, you saw that we have about 90 members and uh, um, the more the better because it gives more of a voice when we speak to uh, different uh, organizations, and especially when we see that they're doing something that might be detrimental to the health of uh, native uh, pollinators, then it's really good to say that, yes, we've got uh, several dozen people or several hundred people uh, who also support these ideas. So please um, follow those links, get involved. It's there for you. Amazing. Thank you. So I just have a couple of closing slides before we take off. Let me just find the right window to share here. Here we go. Okay, you can see a butterfly, correct? Can you see my yes. butterfly? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then I'm just going to hit from beginning. So now you see a moth. <laughs> Is yes. that right? <laughs> okay, perfect. So before we bugger off today, I wanted to ask everyone to type in the chat the topic theme that they would like to see for the next citizen science webinar. Um, what topic you would like to see uh, other presenters to build a theme around and what you're most interested in hearing about. So please think about that before you go and type your answer into the chat so that we can consider that for the next round of webinars. And I would like to thank everyone for joining us and joining the conversation today. It was amazing um, to have this interaction with our presenters. So thanks everyone for your questions. And of course, a huge, large, big round of applause for our amazing speakers today. So if you can put the applause icon in your screens right now to see a nice round of applause for our speakers. Thank you so much for sharing your time as well as your wealth of knowledge about pollinators and citizen science projects. It was absolutely informative and amazing um, to watch all of your presentations. Thank you so much. So remember to go visit us at sitsialberta.com and um, you'll also be able to find the recording of this presentation there um, probably within the, about the next month so you can share it with all of your colleagues and friends as well. As well, there's lots of great resources on the website. And of course, connect with us on social media, have a conversation on our Slack channel and send us an email if you're interested um, in getting more involved. And goodbye and I hope everyone has a beautiful day. Thank you so much again for joining us.